So this it is on air online. Yes, indeed. This is the uh, first podcast titled uh, "The Problem with Parenting," um, and um, I am Laurie Vardis, solicitor, and uh, my um, co-host is uh, Dr. Malcolm Bourne, consultant, uh, child psychiatrist. Um, that's him. Uh, now, um, we have been working together professionally for a number of years. Um, I'm a uh, senior childcare uh, solicitor and have been for more uh, years than I care to remember. And uh, Dr. Bourne is a um, senior consultant, but perhaps you'd like to tell them a little bit more about yourself, Malcolm. Yeah, I've been a consultant in the um, since 1996, so for about 17 years. But the last 10 years, on top of that, I've also been working, and I work with a couple of colleagues who are in child mental health but not doctors, and we provide expert reports and other advice to family courts on um, child cases where, yeah, the problem with parenting is, is the theme that links um, all the child care work we do because, um, as you know, of course, from your work in the family courts, we tend to be looking at children where... Um, something's gone wrong, or professionals think something's gone wrong with parenting. Now, Malcolm, I'm going to interrupt, interrupt you a moment to say that your computer is wobbling up and down whenever you speak. Right. So I don't know if you're knocking it with your feet. No, it's probably just me moving around a bit. I'll, I'll, do you want me to try and put it on something else? Yeah, that would probably be very wise, because I can just see that that's going to be an issue during the course of this. Yeah. Um, as Dr. Uh, okay. doing that, um, I will say that um, I've been in the working the uh, field of um, child care since uh, 1982, um, and have qualified uh, and set up a, a Vardis and Co. in uh, in uh, in okay. This is the wonders of the internet, uh, folks, um, and the wonders of. Um, the technology. I think you. Uh, that looks a lot better. Yes, and, and just to add to that, I. So my company that does the court work is called the CAT Partnership. Um, CAT stands for Child and Adolescent Therapy and Training, training of professionals. And we started as a company or as a as a team about 10, 11 years ago. We're now a limited company, a company's house, um, and we've had the name for so long that even though we don't do much. Training these days, we've stuck with the name because it's a, a known name. And I work with two other people, one of whom is a nurse by background and one of whom is an occupational therapist by background, but they both have worked therapeutically with children for 20 years or more. Now, uh, Dr. Bourne uh, also has some other interests, including, I believe, writing comic books. Yes, um, in my spare time, as I came refer to it. I write some fictional stories in comics and um, graphic novels and I'm also writing a biography right now, not as a comic, it's my stepfather is an opera critic, you know, quite well known. And I've almost finished a book about him. It should be done in the next two weeks. And uh, for my sins I've been uh, lead singer in a band for uh, the last um, 25 or so years uh, and also publish uh, poetry and literature online. Um, and um, that's how we got chatting about this kind of uh, exercise. So the purpose of this podcast is to deal with uh, and listen to, respond to people's queries about um, uh, parenting, particularly relating to uh, issues they may have in respect of uh, their children and partners relating to their children. So it's not just, um, certainly not just child abuse cases at all, it is issues that people have uh, relating to their families and, and children and, uh, and the way they relate to each other. Uh, and for this particular podcast, we've chosen the topic of um, how we are or are not um, influenced by our parents in the way we go on to parent uh, our own children. Uh, and uh, Dr. Bourne, uh, can I just have your initial comments and, and, and thoughts um, on that? Yes, I mean, when we agreed on the topic, it made me think back to um, when I was a teenager, and I'm guessing that whoever watches this who's now an adult will have similar memories where something, uh, probably I was told off or didn't want to do what my parents told me, 
you know, I felt I'd been treated very unfairly, and, and I no doubt shouted at them, I'm not going to be like that with my kids when I grow up. Um, and of course, what happens is we grow up and we have children of our own, and, and then we start saying things to them, and occasionally we think, oh my god, I'm behaving with them like my parents did when, when I was a kid. Have I got it wrong, or is it just inevitable? And, and I think this whole question of how much, as parents, how much we somehow copy or reject or otherwise are influenced by the way we were parented is, is crucial to, I think, my clinical work, but also the whole area that you and I cross over in, which is the family courts. So and how do we, how do we break out of that? Sorry, Sorry, how do we break out of that cycle? Um, of being um, influenced in our parenting techniques by our parents. I didn't hear the first bit of How that. How do we break out of the cycle of being influenced um, in our parenting techniques by our parents? I mean, to, just to give you an example, um, my mother was um, extremely good at um, shouting and not very good at reasoning. So with regard to um, my own parenting uh, techniques, um, what's to... Uh, what's to stop me having that at the back of my mind whenever a child of mine starts um, playing up and pushing boundaries um, to shout first and reason later when that was basically all that I experienced for all the first 16 or so years of my life? Well, I think the first thing to say is, and this would apply to you, me, or anybody else, and I, and I was going to say before, this sort of question is true of every family. It's not just the minority who come into contact with with um, legal services or children's services or clinical work like, like our team. Um, I think nothing is to stop us having that in the back of our mind and I think all of us have it somewhere in our head. Nobody knows for sure how much of the way we behave as parents is as it were hardwired into us because of our early experiences and how much of it is more um, soft wired and we can, we can influence more or play with more. So I think what happens is, um, the, the other word I think it's very important to, to um, discuss or go alongside the question of parenting is, is, is what people like me call attachment and, and you will know of course, um, Laurie, that in every court report you ever see from me or anybody like me, there's always a lot of discussion about attachment and, and what people like you and I mean by attachment in this, in this uh, context is the relationship between a child and their carers, usually obviously the biological parent, and, and most importantly, whether you or I like it or not, because we're fathers, most importantly usually the mother. So what what is clearly passed down from generation to generation, unless there are problems that are dealt with, and not everyone has problems in this area either, what clearly is, is passed down is, a, is an attachment style or a a, a way of a way in which our parents behave with us, parent us exactly as, as, as the title of this suggests. But that attachment is it's what we would all like to see is that the way parents parent their children um, engenders in the child a feeling of safety and security and predictability and all those things are emotional safety and security and predictability as well as if you like, the obvious physical things like giving us enough food and um, keeping a roof over our heads, which are also very, very important. So the parenting is um, a reflection of that attachment style. And attachment, very broadly, is usually described either as secure or insecure. And what that means is a, a secure attachment means the child does feel looked after and nurtured and that life is relatively predictable and safe. And an insecure attachment is the opposite. An insecure attachment is where a child feels that they're not sure they're going to be emotionally cared for and they're not quite sure maybe what's going to happen next emotionally or physically. So when we're looking at a child in a restaurant and we see um, one set of parents sitting there with a child quietly drawing with crayons and very much um, contained within themselves and another child perhaps screaming and going wild and the parents looking desperate uh, to know what to do. How much of that is due to the, those parents' experience of parenting 
originally and how much is that is to do with just a failure to understand how to relate to children which has begun when they were parents. Well I think the first thing I think to say about that is that you, I know this is obvious and I know you know this any individual situation you're never quite sure what it's to do with. I mean the, the screaming child may be perfectly secure and just have had a, a bad day that day um, and the quiet child who you might think everyone's getting on with it craning we actually may find they're all too terrified to do anything else. But in general terms, your question to me was how much of that is because of parenting and how much of that is because of what we remember when we were parented. Those two are the same thing. I think that's the main point is that on the whole, the way we parent our children is very much determined by the way we were parented unless we've done something to really think about that and want to do it differently. And for most people, most of the time, parenting the way we were parented is perfectly reasonable and good, of course. Most, most people, um, most pe most of, for us as adults, most of our experiences as children were, on the whole, positive most of the time. There's a concept that, that in child mental health field of good enough parenting. So parenting doesn't have to be perfect all the time. It has to be good enough to leave the child feeling secure. And if we've had that sort of experience as a child, then the chances are we will repeat that as an adult. But what, what, what I think you're talking about are opportunities when we have time to reason about um, the parenting that we're giving. What about those times where snap decisions are taken because the child is really badly acting out? For example, when a child does something that is um, actually potentially dangerous. Well, the classic one is the child is lying on the floor having a tantrum in the middle of Tesco, which yeah. is dangerous unless they're throwing knives around, but it's dangerous because they might get left where they are, it's dangerous because they might hit their head on the floor, it's dangerous because they might pull a you know, shelf full of cornflakes all over. But, yeah, and what I'm, what I'm really talking about, the, those times where you suddenly have to make a snap decision without really thinking about um, what is the right and wrong of parenting, do we, do we at that point in time the decision when perhaps we might have experienced smacking when we were younger, um, do we suddenly snip back into that point where we think, oh, our parents, subconsciously, our parents dealt with this situation in a certain way, perhaps that's the right thing, and we snip back into dealing with things the way our parents did? I think that's certainly very possible, yes. I think, it, I think the, the snap decisions we make, and this will be true of snap decisions in other ways, but the snap decisions we make in a time of crisis on the whole are informed by our previous experiences. So unless we really, let, let's say for the sake of argument as you say, let's say as a parent we're in that situation, the child is embarrassing us and, and is acting out and all the rest of it and we haven't really thought this through, we're likely to react in a way that mirrors what our parents did to us Although we're also likely to react in a way that reflects the stress we're under at the time. All of us in that situation are more stressed and more vulnerable than we might be. But you're absolutely right. The, the template is going to be our previous experience. And the template for us as a parent is our experience of being a child. So um, it, is, it is certainly true, for instance, and, and you know, there's clinical research on this, that children who are smacked as kids grow up to be parents who smack their children more. I don't mean that in any way as a 100% one-to-one thing, um, but absolutely those sorts of patterns of, of physical chastisement or excessive emotional chastisement are carried over and, and in a way that's common sense because what else on earth are we expected to have learned from? It is normal to copy what our parents did for us because we experience that as the model we were parented by. So, I, and, and I would agree with you, what I think you're suggesting therefore, is that if that's the way we were parented ourselves, and that was wrong for want of a better word, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not getting into the whole smacking debate, but clearly excessive physical punishment is wrong, um, then we are more likely to snap and do that if that's the way we were treated as, as a child. Alternatively though, it may be the case that um, we really have, even in crisis moment, we really may have processed that enough or been scared by it enough, by, by it, I mean having that experience as a child, but it may be the last thing we'd ever do. Somebody who was hit regularly as a child may have already, as they've grown up, um, 
absorbed that information and decided what to do about it. So that even in a crisis, it may be that they've already got a, a model in their head which was never going to include, you know, smacking their child in the middle of Tesco. Do you think that in some ways people who have had a particular uh, kind of parenting experience um, gravitate towards people ultimately who have a similar parenting experience? In other words, people who were hit as a child might um, gravitate towards people who also were hit as uh, children, whether it's subconsciously or, or consciously, uh, to form relationships with them. People who were neglected gravitate towards people who are neglected, or are we trying to look for something different? I think we often do try to look for something similar that reinforces our experiences. So I think one thing I know from, from my clinical work and from my court work, and, and you will know this from court work, is that, um, is that women, mothers who were abused, and I use abused in a very wide sense there, but including physical abuse, or who were exposed to domestic violence. So they may not have been physically hurt themselves, but they may have experienced violence between their parents, um, and which in practice is more father to mother than the other way around. So mothers who have been hit or abused or been exposed to domestic violence, which is in itself abusive, through mechanisms that are not completely understood, are much more likely to choose male partners later in life who are themselves likely to hit their children or them. So we know that that cycle of domestic violence definitely repeats across the generations unless something is done about it. So we're really thinking that people who've experienced that kind of cycle of domestic violence or perhaps people who've experienced a, a, a lot of hitting um, as a child should be encouraged to go to parenting classes what, even before their parents or well, amongst their parents to try and break the cycle. Well, yes, the therapeutic approach to trying to break the cycle is usually twofold. The first bit is looking at themselves as their own their own experiences. So there are a lot of programs. I mean, I, I work clinically in Blackburn in Lancashire, and in Blackburn there's something called the Wish Program. The Wish Program is for women who have been the victims of domestic violence themselves, and it's if you like, it's the precursor to the parenting bit. So that before you can learn as a parent not to choose violent partners. You have to go through some therapy or introspection or looking at the, what is it in yourself that has made you choose that partner. Because it's not usually conscious that, he, that, a, that a woman, or, or for that matter a man who's been hit as a child, it's, not, it's very rarely a conscious thing, oh I was hit, I'm going to go out and choose somebody who's likely to hit my children. But it is an unconscious pattern. So the first thing they need to do is to address what it is in themselves that's caused them to choose that sort of partner. And that in turn, as you've implied really, that in turn means addressing their own childhood experiences. Then the next step might well be, uh, or a parallel step sometimes, it depends how well put together they are psychologically to do both at once. So either a parallel step or the next step is, is yes, is the parenting classes, is the um, the, the teaching really of other ways of dealing with your children because if your model is naughty children get hit then it, it's very easy and understandable why you develop a system that how else do I control my child in the end other than by smacking them but in fact there are many other parenting methods and there are some excellent parenting programs you know, even in today's economic climate where social care is being whittled away and health care is being whittled away by government, um, there are huge numbers still of parenting programs and parenting classes available. And do indeed there is an argument for, for talking about this stuff in school, I mean that's a bit controversial. Yeah. Because do you think people's understanding of this is, uh, is getting better uh, or it, do you think it's just about the same as it was when you entered the profession? I think I think people's understanding that there is a problem is getting better because it's more out there. I mean, the work again, if we just come back to what you and I do um, in the courts, those sorts of cases are much more publicly known now. Um, I don't think necessarily people understand it better. I, 
I, I don't know of any research, I don't think there is any research, for instance, that shows that we're better parents now, or worse parents now, for that matter, than we were a generation ago. Um, but I think the fact that there can be problems that can be resolved is there's more information about that. Okay. Um, I'm going to just um, bring this to a close then by uh, just asking you a quick question, a uh, quick fire question. And that's, um, have you been in a situation when you've been out uh, with your family um, or otherwise when you've seen a parent behaving in a way that you felt was um, just overstepping the boundary, slapping or hitting or something else? Uh, did, were you able to take off your professional hat or did you feel you needed to intervene when you've seen it? Because we've all seen that kind of thing. Yes. I've never actually intervened. Um, I think the trouble is when you're in this profession, your professional hat's always on in a sense, in that those belief systems and those observations are always going on. If, I think if I saw something that was dramatically physically abusive, so I don't mean a smack because I don't think, well, I mean legally it's not abusive to every, you know, to smack your child once is not abuse in itself, as you know. I think if I saw something where a child was getting badly hurt, um, or was in danger, I would intervene. In fact, I have intervened actually, I'm trying to think, I've intervened as a doctor more than a psychiatrist when I've seen, I saw a child running in front of a car recently because the parent didn't look after them properly. And, um, you know, luckily enough, I was able to, to um, pull them out of the way of the car. Um, so, other than that, I've not had to intervene, but you do make observations and um, it's a bit of a gut wrencher sometimes. I remember recently, literally the other day, I was in Asda car park and um, there was a car in it with a mother and two small children and the windows were shut and the mother was smoking. Now, that to me is, you know, they are doing something, choosing to do something that is damaging their child's physical health. And part of me wanted to go and knock on the window and say, you know, you're damaging your child's health. <laughs> I keep thinking I should carry around some post-it notes so I can uh, stick them on cars like that. Um, so yeah, you do see things, but you know, who am I to judge? Okay, I'm a child psychiatrist, but um, it's, you know, we're not policing. I'm not there to police the community. But I think there are situations in which you may not directly physically intervene because of your own safety, but, but if, you, if you feel there's abuse going on in you know your next door neighbour's house, phone social services. Yeah, no, I, I must admit, I had two situations quite recently. Uh, one was uh, where um, a three-year-old was uh, making her way across a room towards uh, the uh, street uh, in the uh, in the party I was in, and uh, without even thinking, the uh, social worker and myself, the child solicitor, were absolutely out there in the street blocking her way before I'd even uh, blinked. It wasn't even something I had a choice over. And everyone else in the room was carrying on. But we were, I think, subconsciously watching what that child was doing the whole time, only child in the room, to make sure that she was safe. Now, another situation where my wife and I uh, were out in a countryside um, pub and just watching this couple, who were very into each other, gradually, increasingly neglect the four-year-old um, they were with so that she was initially seeking attention from a, another table with children of a similar age where the father was almost left to foster that child for uh, an hour and then latterly sitting in the uh, doorway to the pub. And I think that um, it was getting closer and closer to my having to intervene before the uh, mother of the child caught my um, rather extreme expression and realised well, it was a bit it disappointing. It reminds me of, of the family I saw actually on your behalf. Mm. about a year ago when my colleague and I were observing the mother and four small children and one of the children fell over, banged her face on the chair and started crying and the mother didn't move an inch and my colleague, you know, leapt across the room in a single bound and, and picked the child up to comfort her and make sure she was okay. So, yeah, situations come up where, as you say, instinct takes over and you protect the child and I think that's normal. Yeah, I think so. Well, I'm, I'm going to bring this uh, to a close, uh, and thank you for uh, taking part. Now, uh, what we'd like to do is invite questions for the uh, uh, next 
um, podcasts and the problem with parenting. So uh, those questions can be sent uh, to uh, my, my email address, which is at uh, uh, info, I-N-F-O, uh, at avardis.co.uk, uh, um, A-V-A-D-I-S. So info at avardis.co.uk. Uh, uh, keep them short and brief so we can uh, answer them easily. And I believe, Malcolm, you're going to give your email address also. Yeah, it's malcolm.born, or Mike the Born Identity Movies, at virgin.net. I'll just give that again, if you wouldn't mind. Or in fact, info, in fact, our professional address is info, I-N-F-O again, at the Cat Partnership, that's T-H-E, C-A-T-T, partnership.com. So either okay. of those is fine. Okay, well, it's uh, goodbye for now from me, Laurie Pardis. And from me, Malcolm Bourne, and we hope we'll see you in two or three weeks' time. Thank you.